Uh, oh, I see. I see Destiny. Sorry, there she is. I'm not sure if others are going to join us or not. Okay, I just wanted to make sure both the co-chairs were here. It's now 12.01. Do you think we should proceed with the meeting, Destiny? Are you good with that? Yeah? All right, great. So for today, um, we do have the agenda. If you need the link, it's in the chat. Um, we can certainly share it, Destiny, if you don't mind throwing it back in in case. Um, today is December 19th. Um, don't forget the code of conduct for the meeting. Please your be behave yourselves. <laughs> Um, as you're aware, make sure that we adhere to the, you know, respectful and turn taking and sharing and so forth. Um, new faces. Do we have any new faces? I know, I think Jody and Sharla and then Josh. Um, there's, let me look around here. So let's go ahead. Introduce yourselves. New faces. Let's start with Sharla. Go ahead. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. I think I've met a couple of you already and am looking forward to volunteering. Um, I do public relations for Speakeasy Strategies. So uh, the agency I work with supports Linux Foundation in some professional capacities. In this role, I'm strictly volunteering my time. Uh, it's an awesome group of people and I would love nothing more than to do what I can and share my resources to help get your voices out more often in the media. And anyone who has not done uh, media relations or interviews with reporters before, I'm more than happy to one-on-one -on -one, um, have a conversation with you and give some tips and practices. Um, and I know I have a few things on the agenda, but just as a general intro, looking forward to learning how I can support and get involved more in meet everybody. So nice to meet you. Great. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Sharla. Sharla, um, you're the one who got me on CNBC over the summer, right? Correct. Yep. Ah, yes. Yes. That's what I thought. Well, bucket list check for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we can do something similar for more people as well and maybe some more opportunities with you too, Rob. So, yeah. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, and maybe we can get Anastasia on BBC, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Start small. <laughs> just teasing, just teasing. Either way, though. All right. Thank you so much for coming today and volunteering your time. We're always in need of help with PR and public publications. And, you know, Catherine is really amazing, has done a wonderful job. But to add another powerhouse to our group is always a bonus for all of us. So it's wonderful to have you. Thank you. And then who's next? I think Jody. Yeah, hey, uh, my name's Jody. Uh, I have, have a friend at CNCF who recommended um, and sent me links to join this group. Uh, I worked for quite a few years at um, in community living, so working often with people who were deaf, hard of hearing, as well as uh, speech processing, auditory processing, and multiple other challenges. And now I work for an assistive technology company up in Canada. Uh, so we work with um, mostly employment related, but also school related, providing assistive technology um, and technology access to people across Canada. Oh, hello, hello. Very cool. And you, if you need to enter the U.S., we do have the U.S. footprint and or is, I'm sorry, excuse me, do you do anything in the U.S.? You have a U.S. footprint or European footprint as well? Sorry, I don't understand the term footprint. Uh, meaning, like, do you have, you know, a, someone who's able to help out in the U.S. and in the EU, or are you just limited to your, like, Canadian area? Sorry. Our company, uh, the, the department that I work in is Canada only, but we do have an organization called Makers Making Change that works across the U.S. as well. I don't know if we have any chapters in Europe, though. But Makers Making Change provides um, all sorts of mostly 3D printed and open source uh, assistive technology, things like switches, um, adaptive devices, and so on. 
Understood. Very cool. And speaking of auditory and audiological devices, um, the audiological disorders do tend to use those types of things, um, which is an additional reason why we add captions um, for those who may have any sort of auditory difficulty. Utilizing captions does seem to help those as well. So very nice to have you and here supporting us. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And then who else wants to introduce themselves that's new to the group? Okay, it looks like we're good there. Um, all right, next on the agenda, we have Sharla, I see that you put your name on the agenda here that you wanted to talk about PR opportunities. I saw that you mentioned that briefly, but let me look here a little bit further. Do you want to just go ahead and take the floor and walk us through kind of your agenda portion with us if you want to? And we can kind of see where we can go from there. And then um, do you have access to the agenda? Yes. Oh, okay, fantastic. You can go right ahead and walk us through. Perfect. Thank you. So Catherine uh, definitely helped me kind of carve this out. But the thought here is um, there's a, a couple services that journalists use to get sources uh, and to help build out their stories and have more informed stories with people who are actually doing the work. So one of those is called HARO, which stands for Help a Reporter Out. And another one is called ProfNet. There's a few more that are popping up every day. Um, but what I did here is I linked to an example of what it actually looks like in the emails that I get. Uh, and it's not just me, these go out to thousands of public relations professionals. And it's basically a compiled list of all the things that reporters are looking for sources around, ranging from a foot doctor, to um, a health expert, to technology experts, all sorts of avenues. So I'm already looking at these every day for clients. And what I was thinking is if anyone is interested in having their name in an article as an expert source on different technology related topics, um, I'm happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one to kind of better understand what your expert area your, your area of expertise is. And I think Catherine, you said there was a document already where people were kind of um, able to add their name, title, info, and potential areas they are experts on. And then um, what journalists look for, you know, they'll write out a few questions and I guess I can click on the example here and kind of walk through. For instance, John Edwards is a reporter who writes for CIO. And he put an inquiry out asking for experts to answer four different questions. One was, what's the best way to improve IT performance without killing IT team morale, for example? So what they are looking for in response to this is short sound bites that they can then integrate into their article or steps for improvements or just basic things. It, it, if it's too long, they won't read it. Um, it also is hard to put in an article. Generally, articles are, you know, uh, 500 words. So um, then I can send this back to the reporter, or if you're interested in working without me being a bottleneck, uh, then you can also sign up for these services, and I'm happy to review your answers and just see if you're on the right track and then go from there. And Catherine had the great idea in our Slack channel, I can just create a thread and constantly update these as I see them. And I, I would expect probably three opportunities a week. And some obviously holidays are a little slow, um, you know, and that's if I'm obviously in the office and doing things, but I will try and put them there and I'm happy to work uh, collaboratively with you all if you have questions and get you, you know, on ramp to understand how this works. And then hopefully we see some quick results too. And I will limit it to, what I call quality publications, because there's a lot of random ones too that I don't think are probably worth your time. And I'm happy to answer questions or go into more detail, Rob, whatever you think is best. Oh, great, yep. Um, I mean, it is nice to have, you know, there are some of us that will be able to kind of provide our names um, 
that way, you know, we can, you know, we are leading experts in the industry and we do have very qualified people here in our group that can contribute. And I think it will be nice to get our names out there if they are needed and certainly passing that information along to us. Sharla, I know, you know, you may have some that are in India, Europe and the UK. So that way we can kind of get the word out even farther and share our expertise across the globe. Um, we also kind of then we'll have a better understanding of knowing how to show people that, you know, deaf and hard of hearing individuals have hiring potential and are great contributors to the, you know, technical community and so forth. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I see here, can I just introduce myself? Oh, jo oh, sorry, Josh mentioning, kind of looking to see, to have two or three int people introduce themselves. So go ahead, Destiny. Um, Destiny here. Hi, Jody and Sharla. My name is Destiny. Last name is O'Connor. I am the co-chair for this group. Um, first of all, it's very nice to meet you. Um, I am the web developer and I was a speaker for, excuse me, the interpreter's just asking for clarification. Oh, Cubicon, excuse me, in Chicago. Um, I was a keynote speaker for that. And um, I have I'm one of I found one of the 10 nonprofits that shows the deaf and hard of hearings and technology. And so I'm that's who I am. So who would like to go next? And for again, it's nice to meet you all. And please, the rest of you, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Sandeep, maybe you'd like to go next. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, I work. I work as a lean software engineer with Norton, the company behind the Norton antivirus. I am based out of India, and it is like one forty-five a.m. for me in the night. But the passion of this group keeps me awake. When I was very happy to meet a couple of folks at the Cube Con North America, and since then I have been hooked to this group. Yes, and so um, I know that there are some here who are COAs. Um, they may be hearing, but they sign as well. John Z might be one of those. CODAs, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I'm not a CODA, um, <laughs> but my family, a lot of my family is uh, deaf and hard of hearing. And so, yeah, my name's uh, John. Ziola, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my daughter is uh, hard of hearing, uh, moms, uncles, lots of families, my brother is deaf, uh, et cetera. So that's why I'm involved in this. Uh, uh, so I work in like the cloud native security and compliance. I need to learn the sign for compliance. Do we know, is there a sign for, what's the oh, sign? Compliance. For... compliance, sorry. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. I'll, I'll go next. Um, my name is Amy June Heinlein, and I currently work with the Linux Foundation building exams for emerging open source technology, but my roots are in digital accessibility. Ta-da. Hi, Amy June. <laughs> And Anastasia, Anastasia says, I'm Anastasia, I'm from Ukraine, um, but I am currently living in the UK and I'm on the accessibility team. And for the British Telecom Company. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to be here and have the opportunity to interact with all of you and make things more accessible because the industry that I work in, I've noticed that there's issues with accessibility. Things are not often accessible, especially conferences. And I'm hoping that with our focus here, we'll be able to impact that and hopefully make it so that there are more conferences that are accessible and open up more pathways and more careers for people. Uh, 
Let's see. Who else? Malad. He says, I was hoping to go last, but it's fine. I'll go. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Malad. And that's my sign name for the dimple on my cheek. I live in Hungary. And it's right in the middle of Europe. Um, I've had two different videos that I promote as far as content technology um, for deaf people trying to spread awareness and increase that awareness throughout the world uh, that deaf people are in technology and some of it we still need things to be accessible. Um, I work at a company and do tech services for different clients. And most generally hearing clients. And I grew up, to, I, I did web services before. Thank you, Destiny, for finding me and introducing me to the group and bringing me along. It's been amazing. Um, thank you, Destiny, for that opportunity to learn and to be amongst many deaf, talented tech people here. It's amazing. I love it. And I want to make the world a more accessible place. And just thank you. Rob says, in the interest of time, um, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Malad. Um, I'm still working to get Linux Foundation event group team um, to get information from them as far as cost uh, on spent for accommodations for the conference to see if going forward, how it is that we can make adjustments on that over time. So still working on that. When I find out that information, I will let you all know, but I don't have those results yet. I am I reached out to them once, I need to follow up. I haven't been trying to um, be annoying to them. Um, but if any of you also need mentoring, let me know. I'm happy to assign people if you're interested in potentially setting up a program. Uh, let me know. I know that sometimes deaf and hard of hearing people are scared to get into this tech space and we want to make it easier and more welcoming for them to be able to do so. Um, so we're thinking potentially a mentorship program would be good. So definitely think about it if you're interested or not. EU prep. Um, we've been talking with the Paris group as far as what it is that they need from us, uh, trying to pr prep. We were just having some conversations in Slack. So, um, Sandeep, I see you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Rob, I have one question. So when you talk about mentorship, are you looking for mentors or mentees or both? Both. Both. Both, yes. Some of you are already have the skills and could be great mentors, and others want to pick up some skills and would be good mentees. So so we're definitely looking for both. Milad? Malat says, so um, does this mean like potentially you could host a workshop and talk about technology? Would this be like presenting in a workshop? Is that mentorship? Rob says, no, that's a little bit differently. Um, the goals and priorities are different, different for a workshop versus mentorship. Workshop would be general learning about uh, technology. I'm going to be hosting a Kubernetes workshop. So that would be for people to be able to learn, whereas mentorship would be different. That's providing guidance, one-on-one um, -on -one hand-holding for the person. Um, they potentially would share if they have a problem at work and get your feedback on it, say like, what should I have done in this situation? Um, how is it that I can get accommodations or, or like interpreters or captions or something like that? 
that that's more of um, what mentorship would be. But we're hoping if we can plan that and come up with a program later. Um, Catherine, you wanted to talk about sign language interpreters. Um, yeah, so um, as you've probably seen, we are trying to gather or create a database of sign language interpreters that are uh, have experience with uh, in the tech field around the world. Um, so we created a um, form, a Google form, um, which I'll share here in the chat as well, because we too have two sign language interpreters here who might be interested. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so basically I think this is ready. Um, Celia from the, CNC, uh, from the Linux Foundation team asked me to add an additional question and some other CNCF verbiage uh, that is now there. So I do think that we can start um, reaching out and uh, sending this to interpreters. We, you know, right, like you have your favorite interpreters, you know they're good. Uh, and basically it's not only in the US, it's like everywhere. Um, so the idea is if uh, the CNCF needs uh, one or if, uh, for instance, um, a local event in Hungary needs one, you know, like, and then that they can see and and, and find them easily. Uh, we also do not want to work with agencies. We want to work with freelancers directly. So uh, yeah, the freelancers get more money. It's a little bit more uh, cheaper for us. So it's a win-win situation basically. So uh, I think that is ready um, and it will take a long time until we have a real good solid database, uh, but you have to start somewhere, right? So hopefully um, in a few years, we'll have a good amount of people in there. Uh, the other thing is um, for KubeCon Paris. So for the people who've been in, who have been in KubeCon Chicago, you've seen um, that there's a project pavilion so where the projects are, right? Like uh, I was there with the LinkedIn project. And so um, tags can uh, also request a kiosk and uh, it can be part-time. It doesn't have to be full-time. And so you share it. And I think, or why I think it could be very valuable is because one of the things that is really key is as I mentioned before, a lot of people have never, or most people at the conference never have never really interacted with anyone who is deaf or hard of hearing, right? So people don't understand the challenges and it's like, like accessibility is this abstract concept. Everyone knows it's good and we should do it, but it's not real. It doesn't feel real unless you meet someone and talk to someone, right? When you have a face and you know a story. So really these one-on-one -on -one, uh, encounters are really important to get like real allies, right? People who are committed, right? And so what I, I was thinking is uh, we can have, could have one and then um, we don't have to have the whole team there. We would have like little shifts, you know, I think uh, uh, the our tag, like the uh, tag contributor strategy has done that before where it's like a, a shift of one and a half hours. So two people are there. And then on the screen, we have like a big come talk to us, you know, uh, want to meet a deaf uh, engineer or some, something like, uh, uh, you know, encouraging people just to come and chat and ask questions, you know, like, what does it mean to be deaf in tech? Uh, what kind of access, like whatever they want to ask or engage or I don't know. It's just like having that contact and, and putting a face to this abstract concept of accessibility. I think it's really important. So um, yeah, my question, what do you think? And that's mostly for the people who are uh, hoping, uh, who are planning to be in, in, in uh, Paris, of course, because you would have to volunteer as well to be there uh, for a little time. Um, so open question to everyone. Okay, yeah, thumbs up from Anastasia. Rob says, um... I think an hour or two hours, an hour and a half, like you said, rotate around. I think that that would be good. And if we have two or more people on each shift, yeah. I think that we could come up with a schedule and make it work. If we don't have enough people there, maybe we could just do a morning session or an afternoon session, um, either way. But we can play it by ear. 
Um, sorry, no, I said that the wrong way. Play it by eye. We're deaf people. We don't play it by ear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Um, right. And I did uh, sign us up, by the way, anyways, because I was like, it's always first come, first serve. So I was like, I told Rob, it's like, okay, if if we don't, if we decide not to do it, we can always say, oops, uh, sorry, no. So I think we're one of the first signing up, so we should get it. Uh, and then again, and then also uh, just something to keep in mind, it's not like someone is going to see and say like, oh, you have to be there all the time. I mean, we shouldn't pick one and then never be there right like but, but there are like times when it's really like we're like closer to the end it's like not as busy so uh, it's okay to kind of close down early which other projects do as well so um john do you have a question or comment yeah i was just thinking in terms of the public meeting and uh having those conversations that it's neat to be able to ask the question specifically of engineers and to have interpreters there to facilitate a very smooth conversation. But it might be interesting to sometimes not also not use interpreters so that people understand you can come up and talk to someone directly. And there are all of these tools that will help facilitate the communication between somebody who signs and somebody who doesn't sign. I like that. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Catherine, so I like this. This idea sounds beautiful of having this uh, project pavilion. So, how do we go about it? I mean, I mean, the days for the CFP are already over. So, how do we go about setting this up? Set the uh, the uh, getting a project, uh, uh, getting a kiosk in the project pavilion. You mean? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that is uh, something, if you have a project, like, uh, for instance, we're, my company's part of the Linkerd project, or if you're part of a tag, like uh, Josh and I, you get an email saying, this is available. This is not available for the public. So you have to be a CNCF project or a tag. So this is not, it's free, which is kind of nice. So like, if you have a booth, right, like you saw at KubeCon, that's very expensive. <laughs> Companies have to buy that, but the little kiosks are free uh, and it's all open source or community stuff. So uh, they send an email and there is a form and it's first come first serves, which is why I submitted it right away. And we will find out, um, I don't know when, but yeah. So that's how it works. It's internal. It's not something you will see externally. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and then I had one more thing. So basically on from the advocacy side, the stuff that is next on our to-do list is, so as you all know, we created a recommendation for conferences on, a, uh, on the website. And then after that, we did all these Google Docs with recommendations uh, after or feedback after Chicago and for uh, Paris, and that's all in our drive, and that's not ideal. So uh, I'm not really looking forward to it, but of course the right thing to do is kind of put that all in the public recommendations, right? So we should kind of see like, because like, uh, we've learned a lot going there, so we need to update that. So I think that's important because we want that to be as accurate and complete as possible, because hopefully at some point, other conferences will know about this page and will come and and uh, and and look for uh, guidance. Um, so, and then as a reminder, we did have. So I don't know, I, uh, timeline wise, the CNCF was willing to create a uh, award for companies that hire people with disabilities. So. Uh, it's up to us to come up with a, a award name and um, create a form similar to the um, uh, one for the interpreters. Something uh, where, how do you nominate someone? We were talking last time about maybe not anyone should be able to uh, nominate someone, maybe people who are um, uh, 
uh, who have some type of disability are the most are the ones who should nominate. I don't know. Like we have to think about that how we want to do this. Um, we have a lot of things on our on our to do list, so I don't know where. I mean, it would be great to have it for Paris, but we might not uh, get it on time because we also need time for people to nominate and so on. Um, but we may try. And the other thing, the last thing that we, uh, that is kind of like, yeah, that it would be great if we can uh, do that soon is recommendation for community events. Um, that are the events, like the one that Milad, you try to, uh, um, attend, right? Like what can they do to make it more, um, uh, to be more accessible? And also uh, I did ask the CNCF if they would be willing to have like a accessibility technology toolkit that they pay for and that local events could get. And they said, yes, but that again is up to us to come up with what would that be? What is it? Uh, what does it look like? And so on. Um, so yeah, that's like, the things that kind of I kind of had put on the list that I think that we should be working on, uh, just FYI, and then like I'll start pushing that on the Slack channel. It would be great if we could get, uh, yeah, input and help. Um, and I think with that, I'm done with my points. Catherine. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. Sandeep, I see you have a question. Uh, yeah. So my question is that, Catherine, we have like a lot of Google documents. Okay. We have a lot of Google forms. So maybe we try to put everything in one place. Because in the last, in one week, I'm filling up like three different documents and sometimes I sort of lose sense of which document I'm filling or where to search. So maybe we have a single page that lists the document, like indexing it and then linking to the document that we would. Yes, so ideally everything should be, everything that's conference related. Slack be... might... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine, sorry. Sorry, was I over? <laughs> Everything should be in that uh, on that website, ultimately. Like the link that I just put in the chat. Also, Rob here, I just wanted to mention that, you know, Slack may be a good option as well, because within Slack, there is the pinned option. Um, so if you go into that and you pin those, you, those various documents are listed within that area. So we can utilize that option. And that may be a nice starting point for us to kind of centralize this. Um, I know that Josh, who just left the meeting, the one with the beard, um, he is reorganizing right now and um, making sure that all of our docs and Google Docs um, are at a better it better to be in an organized manner. And I'm not sure if he shared with the rest of the group, but the chairperson, um, we, you know, basically, so everything has a home and is more easily accessible for all of us. And I will share that, um, that pinned area, share that in that pinned area as well on Slack. Well, we actually have, uh, so the, the folder is pinned there. So maybe that's something that I should have said before. So the folder, so we have a shared folder for our group. And then within that folder are subfolders for stuff for the website, um, for uh, subject matter experts, where the stuff is in that uh, Charla is working on. And so we've been trying to keep it very organized. Um, so that's where you find everything. Um, I thought you were referring because we had so many KubeCon documents and that's true because we were rolling it out First is like feedback and then, but so that is not ideal, of course, right? Because it should be all in one document. And that's just like to to work and like get the flow and get people to kind of put their thoughts in it. But of course, ultimately, it should all be in that one document together, right? People should not be looking. And it should be public because we want everything we're working on, right? It's taking time and effort. We shouldn't hide it in some 
Google Drive. It should be available for the world to see and use. Awesome. OK. Um, so it's now 36 after the hour. Um, I think we're kind of on a good time right now as far as our pace goes. So I think that we had something on CLG. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that uh, we are going to have the Cubicon group with Rob on the 18th of January. Um, Rob's at following Rob's lunchtime, which I believe is a Cubicon workshop, excuse me. Um, I'm suggesting the 28th with Rob in ASL, or if you may have some better ideas, um, please feel free to share that with me. Um, then the format as far as the uh, Q at our Q and A, or if we're just going to do like one session, um, maybe a ten minute Q and A session and forty minutes of presentation, and then ten minutes of um, Q and A, or two separate sessions um, with ten minutes, um, and then another forty minutes and ten minutes. Like what you may think is best as far as how to set that up. Rob here, Sandeep. We're on agenda, um, the item that says Anastasia, and it's Deaf in Cloud, um, the organization for the 28, the crash course with Rob. The Kubernetes workshop. Kubernetes workshop, excuse me, thank you. Do you see where we're referring to, Sandeep? Okay, Sandeep, are you okay with that? Okay, Destiny here. Um, the interpreter is just trying to watch what Anastasia said because some of the um, words aren't translating accurately into the closed caption. So Sandeep is getting a little lost because the closed caption is picking up what the interpreter is saying right now with the interpreter having to kind of try to figure out the context here accurately. So that's why Rob's relaying the agenda item. Great, Anastasia here. So one session, should we do that or should we have two sessions separately? What would you think is best? Rob answering, I think there's probably gonna need to be a total of four or five. Okay, would you like them to be one hour or two hours? I'm feeling like each session being one hour would make the most sense in response to that, Anastasia. Okay, so will we do them bi-weekly or do you want them once a month? Um, I think maybe if we do them weekly or bi-weekly is best in my opinion, Rob here. And Anastasia is saying, okay, so we need to kind of set the date. So what do you think is best? Um, for example, I, you know, I'm thinking maybe what we should do is just maybe one date, have a presentation and then say maybe the next date is when um, we can have some response. Um, I think that we need to kind of decide the dates, first of all, and then from there, kind of who is going to be in attendance from our group, um, who will be presenting, and then, oh, and yes, um, the registration, when we will have the pre-registration open so people can go ahead and register or um, scholarship registration links or, you know, kind of make those calls. For the interpreter though, um, I think we just need to clarify what you said. So pre-con pre registration is open. So we need to, do we need to mail send out an application or the word here, destiny is clarifying, Rob saying it's fine. Um, I think we, I can share it in Slack, Rob here. I think somebody else is, Catherine is, has her hand up. Uh, yeah, I think because I saw here um, on the note, like, so basically you're asking uh, if you should register for KubeCon because I know someone posted something in the Slack. So you're all, some, you're all um, applied for the scholarship. So you have to wait until 
that is approved. So no action uh, needed until until you actually get approval. Otherwise, you would have to pay, right? So because then you get a little code that tells you it's free. Um, okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, yeah, so I think Rob's saying here, go ahead, register for the scholarship, send in your registration for the Cubicon, but hang on to that registration um, to find before you until you find out whether you're paying for yourself. And then as far as the hotel goes, I do recommend that you go ahead and reserve that now. You can always cancel that within 72, beyond 72 hours so that I would suggest you go ahead and book your hotel room. So that way, if you do get the scholarship, you're ready. Um, as far as scholarships, let me think what else is in my brain here. Scholarships, registrations, hotel, yep. Flights, we'll hold off on as well until we know more, but yeah. And also, if I may say real quick, um, so because our team already um, booked hotels and the hotels through the website are either non-refundable or really expensive. And we found one that is fairly uh, um, close and walking distance and was on the cheaper side, like for Paris cheap, let's say. Uh, so uh, I shared that. I can share that again, but you can do your own research too. But, but like we had a pro doing research. So it's like, if, if you want, you can do that. That should be completely refundable. And uh, yeah, for some reason, it was not very convenient the way they did it this time, because you definitely want to be sure you have something refundable and until you get confirmation. Understood. Okay. Plus, plus, we might be in the same hotel, which would be fun. It would be fun if we were all in the same hotel, yes. <laughs> Um, Anastasia says, I actually forgot one more thing. Milad, can you um, show that management session document? Milad says, yeah, I think it'll be a live presentation at KubeCon. And I feel like we can be flexible with the presentation. The important thing is that we have questions, hopefully in advance that we can have as part of the program. So um, almost like a chat feature that would pop up for us. And if we saw that there was a good question that came up, then we would automatically advance that question so that we answered it during our presentation. If the questions didn't seem immediate, then we could just hold all of the questions till the end. But really we would be kind of filtering them out as we were presenting so that um, if they seemed super pertinent, we could answer them. If not, um, we could wait until the end. Try to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, would love to have a discussion on more, how we can get that to be more interactive um and direct and make it so people learn from it. Rob says I just want I yeah, I just wanted to say, oops. And Rob says, yeah, we can figure that out as it gets closer. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh yeah, so I just wanted to say we were talking about the meetup group, not KubeCon right now, because there's some confusion. So KubeCon is the big conference, <laughs> right? And Milad, Anastasia uh, are now officially the co-organizers of the first deaf uh, community group of the CNCF. So that's really exciting. I think you, I, sh I shared with you the little link. We did. And so those are the meetup events that, that Rob will start and so on. It's a different thing from KubeCon, just because I think like at some point uh, KubeCon was said, uh, and I just wanted to clarify, so there was no confusion. The interpreter probably messed that up. I'll own it. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing with so many events. Yeah.
Um, okay, Catherine, the video yeah. interpreter or the interpreter video. Actually, any questions before we jump on to that topic? And Destiny says, um, I wanted to talk about the um I wanted to talk about the Deaf Cloud Native and Community Crash Course with Rob. That's gonna be starting soon in January. He says the third week of January. The third week of January, okay. It's gonna be live. It's gonna be an hour during my lunchtime. Um, for you, it would be two o'clock in St. Louis, Destiny. Um, Sandeep, it's probably midnight for you. <laughs> Sorry. Sandeep, go ahead first. You have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question. So I think Catherine, uh, uh, you just now said that you are talking about the meetup, the deaf in the cloud native. Uh, so I think it says that where we host regular tech meetups in sign language. So like if I want to present at the meetup, can I present or only signers can present? So far we don't have any sign language interpreters um... We, I think we should, we could probably ask if the CNCF could provide one. Uh, I'm sure they would do that. I, I don't, yeah, but we, we would have to request that because right now we just did it like that because it doesn't require any, other, we can just run with it. We don't need any support other than the platforms that any other group is using as well. But I think we should, we, we could definitely, um, ask for that and my feeling is because it's just an hour I um, that that should be doable but I cannot promise because I'm not signing off on budgets but let's plan for it and ask okay that's a good idea John oops he posted uh, about uh ambassador funding Lots of stuff. Thank you. I just wanted to add to Sandeep's comment. Um, I know that we want to learn from this group and you want to learn from the presentations and the one-on-ones, but I think right now we're in it, the infancy stages in figuring out how it is that we want to proceed with this and how it is that we want it to flow. I feel like once we become a little bit more mature, we'll understand what it is that we want to do and we'll have kind of a proof of concept that we can give to CNCF that they would be willing to support more so instead of something in such an infant stage. Um, and then hopefully, as we become more robust, we can make it accessible for everyone. That's just my thought. Yeah. And so, well, one of the exciting things is, uh, is that on that platform, you have like meetup groups all over the world, right? Like, and then now we have like one that is for the deaf community. So that's, uh, that's great, right? It, uh, and um, we are also requesting if we could get like a YouTube channel, cause I would love to have a uh, signed content on our YouTube channel. So we're, um, um, Anastasia, Milan and me and our, uh, on a, on a, um, Slack, um, um, uh, um, DM with, uh, the CNCF person to just see like, how does it work, uh, setting up the tools and so on. Um, because it would be great to have like all that content like in one place uh, and also for the CNCF or Linux Foundation to own it, gives it a little bit more credibility out there. Uh, and um, one of the things that I was thinking as well is like uh, the creating videos for interpreters um, about cloud native terms, how to sign them, right? Because we like now for Paris, we're going to have like interpreters in Paris and then okay, how do you sign all these cloud native things? And I think they're probably not like, maybe they're not established terms, but maybe this group can somehow say like, 
let's just agree on doing it like that and have like little intro videos. So interpreters can see that before, um, before they um, go to Paris or whichever conference and are a little bit more prepared. So I think for the YouTube channel, it would have like that content and sign language. And, but also like we could have like a list where we do like stuff for inter resources for interpreters because the more the interpreters know, the better they can serve you. So it's like really a win-win situation, right? And and specifically with such a thing that's so niche as cloud native, we we need to help because yeah, it's just hard otherwise, right? So I was seeing like the thing is like I was seeing like doing this the, these videos as part of of that community group, be it like live or like just as a YouTube channel. Because the YouTube channel I kind of see like as the same kind of project. So Milad and Anastasia, I just volunteered you for that. Sorry. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I was thinking that we're probably going to need a platform um, for putting all of this information down. And Rob says the different quotes or the, the uh, what do you mean? It's just like the content. Um, Rob says, so, oh, what technology CNCF has? No, 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 for the interpreters. Oh, okay. Um, for the interpreters so that they can understand or learn the words. Oh, okay. Various levels. Okay. And she's like, maybe we have it on a website or, okay, that. YouTube, Rob says, YouTube, yeah. Basically what Catherine was just saying. Yeah, and we can we can also include that in the website, have like a section for interpreters where we have the embedded YouTube videos, right? And then you have two places where people can find it. Yeah, that's all I had regarding that uh, video. He says, or we can make like a, a Marco Polo, oh, no, sorry, an MP4 video and then upload that on GitHub. Like Sandeep was saying, either way, yeah. But I think it, it's always going to be easier for an interpreter to just click on a link and probably YouTube might be easier for just random interpreters to find. However, it would be good to have it in two different places um we could have it in our own personal documentation like would be github and then uh youtube okay rob says okay um i do believe that's it and it is 54 after the hour so the floor is open for five six minutes anything that you all want to add and Malad says, Paris Hotel. Paris Hotel. Um, I feel like I was a little bit shocked that they're saying book the hotels now. I'm like, wow, how do we go about doing that? I want to make sure that, I mean, I do want to make sure that we're all staying at the same hotel. I'm hoping that we can um, do that. Maybe we book or have a conversation about it after the holidays, hoping we can find a um, hotel that's not super expensive. And I um, didn't really want to book the hotel and then not have the scholarship happen. So when do we think we're gonna hear back as far as if we got the scholarship or if we have to pay? I. Well, I don't know when exactly you're going to get it, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of the hotels can will be booked out when you when you know it, like the closest ones. Um, so you can always book a hotel and cancel later. So that's why I was saying do not book through the CNC, like the, the KubeCon one, because for some reasons uh, they are not refundable. I'm not sure you have to pay right. I think you can just book and then you don't even have to pay right away. So if you have that flexibility, I would just do it now 
And then when you hear back, just make sure that like when is the date and so on. And then uh, normally it should be by the time you know, you should be able to book and then, uh, to just cancel should you get uh, have a no. But I would not wait because it's a big conference. And the more we wait, the, yeah, the farther away you will be. Um, Rob and Destiny were pretty far away, right? Like, so just because they wait, like they only booked it afterwards, so. And they needed an Uber, right? Like, well, we also needed an Uber, but. Hmm. Yeah, okay. We'll have to talk about that. We did have one point though, Rob. Regarding the meeting uh, time, that's the last point on the agenda. So if we want to reevaluate it because Sandeep cannot, like this is uh, obviously not a great time for. Um, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, um, we're going to change the meeting time every month to rotate times. Um, last month, what time did we meet? Anastasia says five. Okay, five. Five. Uh, Destiny says it was 10 in the morning for us. Okay, 10. Um, and then just now was two. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking based on Chicago time before it was 10. And now we were, we're just going to go back and forth between 10 and 2. But that would make it so that the meeting, um, should we follow european time what it seems like there's a good amount of europeans here i want to be respectful of their time um we have one person in india we have a, a good amount from europe so what would the best time be when do you work when would I mean, we don't have to fit the u.s time zone malat says i feel like 10 in the morning works rob says sandeep sandeep do you work following U.S. time zones or do you follow in India time zone? I work in the India time zone, but sometimes I also work in the U.S. time zones. Probably like not entire night. Yeah, because sometimes I am like I am the only person in India in my team. So if I want to catch up with the fox in the U.S., I stay up late. So maybe I think we can do like something like a 9 a.m. PST or something. 9 a.m. Pacific time. What? Yeah, morning. Morning. 9 PST. So 11. Okay. Right. On. Okay. Not too far from now. 9 a.m. Yeah. will be like, it will be like 10.30, 10 p.m. in the night for me. That's okay. Okay. The only thing that I want to like, yes, Oops. So UTC that means nine uh five five PM, six PM, right? Um interpreter has a hard stop. Okay. Uh, Okay, we we do it on Slack. We continue on Slack the conversation. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.